Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here so early in the morning. I know it is a challenge, particularly on a uh, on a Friday. Um, let me also just um, acknowledge the um, traditional owners of the land, the Wurundjeri people here, the Kulin Nation. Um, let me pay my respects to their elders, past, present, um, and emerging, indeed, to all First Nations people. Um, so it is, as Michael said. Um, an enormous pleasure actually to be back at the University of Melbourne and the Melbourne Energy Institute um, and it is the place that does hold um, special relevance for me uh, so a real pleasure to to be here um, particularly among such um, educated and informed um, colleagues in the energy transition so I'm looking forward to sharing a few insights and I'm sure we'll have some good um, uh, some good Q&A at the end. Australia's energy transition is just happening at such a pace um, and uh, happily AMO have uh, released a whole series of uh, uh, engineering publications recently we've also had some really um, interesting engineering experiences recently um, which I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll, we'll come to. So today's topic um, if I can work out the slides is uh, paving the way to uh, Australia's net zero uh, energy future. So AEMO, um, awkward acronym, but uh, Australia's um, independent energy market and system operator. And our role really is to um, ensure safe, reliable and affordable energy today and to enable the energy transition uh, for the benefit of all Australians. And there has just been an absolutely seismic shift um, in the pace of the energy transition in Australia. We all know that this transition is being driven by a multitude of factors, uh, from policy developments to consumer sentiments to technology development. Um, and um, amongst all of that, of course, the Australian government has now legislated for um, uh, net zero by 2050 um, and 43% uh, uh, reduction in 2005 level um, emissions by 2030 and a target of 82% of all electricity in our grid to be supplied by renewable energy by 2030. Um, and that target, of course, complements the state government targets that have existed for some time um, and is the step to towards a net zero economy. And of course, um, the first step to a net zero economy is a net zero energy system. So creating that net zero energy system is, um, is possible because the way Australia um, generates and consumes electricity um, is changing. Um, and Australia's energy future, I often say, will be built on four pillars. The first is renewable energy, and that's taking advantage of the abundant resources that Australia has to offer from the sun and the wind and the water. The second um, is firming capacity, and that firming capacity is there to um, shave off the peaks and fill in the gaps from that variable renewable energy. The third um, is new transmission and uh, upgraded distribution networks um, to be able to connect these new forms of generation and firming to our towns and cities. And fourth is a grid that is capable at times of running at 100% renewable energy. And that is a feat that is unparalleled anywhere in the world. So that sounds like a pretty big job. How do we get there? Well, let's, let's spend a few minutes on it. The best place to start um, is the integrated system plan. Um, and that integrated system plan, the ISP, um, is the 30 year blueprint for the national electricity market. Um, it is the least cost, and least regret pathway um, as uh, the NEM takes its shape uh, over the next 30 years. And because no one knows exactly how things will play out, um, of course, uh, it starts with a number of scenarios. We asked our stakeholders um, which scenarios are most likely and uh, went through a whole series of um, analyses and feedback loops. Um, and our stakeholders tell us that the scenario that's called step change um, is the most likely and most plausible environment and pathway uh, for Australia's energy systems. Step change um, sees 
40% of the coal-fired generation in the NEM withdrawn over the next five years. 60% by 2030, that's 14 gigawatts of capacity withdrawn, 87% by 2035 and all gone by 2042. And to replace that coal, um, we need a huge amount of investment uh, in the four areas that I mentioned earlier, actually. So Australia is already, and you probably know, um, installing renewable energy at one of the fastest rates in the world. In fact, on a per capita basis, the fastest in the world. And we need that rate to continue um, every year for the rest of this decade. Um, we'll need five times the distributed solar uh, that is already uh, on the network. Um, and today, about a third of all homes in the national electricity market have rooftop solar, uh, equating to a total of about 15 gigawatts of capacity. Uh, we expect that that will uh, increase to around 65% of homes uh, and uh, 69 gigawatts of capacity in distributed systems. Many of those um, complemented by home battery storage systems. Storage, grid scale storage, um, needs to grow by a factor of 30 uh, from two gigawatts today to 60 gigawatts um, in 2050. And that is just an, an enormous amount of investment. And so since this step change, which I, if you haven't read through the integrated system plan, I would encourage you to, it is a great read. Um, it is just such a staggering amount of investment and change. It really does highlight the the real and growing urgency and need uh, for investment and to prepare our energy systems uh, for that future. And look, announcements of uh, retirements of coal-fired power stations um, are abundant. Um, and these plants, as I said before, currently account for uh, around 40% of the NEMS um, generation capacity. Um, uh, to uh, connect the replacing generation, we're identifying around 10,000 kilometres of, uh, of new transmission uh, projects to connect that new renewable generation and, and firming into uh, towns and cities. But look, as good as the integrated system plan is, and I do say it's good, and actually um, having just been visiting a whole series of our sister system operators um, around the world, uh, I know that this is actually a world leading document it doesn't have all the answers. Um, and so to understand the challenge of how we would navigate towards um, those, uh, a, a grid that is high renewables uh, with more renewable generation, firming capacity uh, and the networks. Um, we have an, at AMO a number of um, concurrent and intersecting uh, streams of work that are underway to help us navigate this, uh, this challenge. And those streams of work um, are paving our way to net zero. So these six, um, let me just list them off and then I'm gonna come back to them uh, and use them as a bit of the structure for uh, what I'll say throughout this talk. Um, there's an engineering roadmap to 100% renewable energy, which uh, we just released last week, actually. Uh, some technical reports on um, system security, inertia um, and ancillary control services also just uh, released last week. There's the connections reform initiative. There's the delivery of major uh, transmission projects, which are the actionable ISP projects. The NEM 2025 reforms, which are um, derived from the Energy Security Board recommendations um, uh, late last year uh, and aimed at um, uh, upgrading the market systems uh, to enable that net zero transition. And importantly, our operations technology roadmap to ready AMO's control rooms and our control systems uh, for those uh, high renewables grids. And those six streams underpin this transition to, as I said, more renewable energy, more firming capacity, um, smarter networks, um, and a grid that can operate at high renewables penetration. So, um, <clears throat> So many benefits uh, to the energy transition, so many challenges. Among the benefits, of course, is the price um, and the economics of it. Um, you'll see price, uh, energy prices in the newspapers today. Um, and these pressures will um, continue uh, 
uh, and should actually continue to press the urgency of this transition for Australia. Um, I often say that the best way to um, uh, to decouple Australia's energy prices from global international price shocks um, is to continue that investment into firmed renewable energy, which is, of course, the uh, least cost generation um, and least cost electricity for Australian energy consumers. But um, no matter how uh, interesting this challenge is, um, no matter the benefits, there is a huge amount of, uh, of work to do. So let me start with the engineering roadmap to 100% renewables. Um, this is the report that um, uh, essentially delves into the preconditions um, that would need to be met in order for the national electricity market to be able to operate at periods of time of up to 100% uh, renewable energy. It is absolutely a seminal piece of work. Um, actually, just a week or so ago after it was published, I shared it with um, the system operators of California and Texas, uh, the UK and others. Um, and it is a piece of work that doesn't exist um, anywhere in the world at the moment. We are really breaking um, new ground. And um, it's come uh, on the series of some preliminary reports, uh, but, it's just, it's such an important piece of work. And not long after I started at AMO, uh, the engineering team um, showed me this, uh, this scatter diagram um, that models the increasing penetration of uh, renewables um, in the NEM. And it shows here um, that by 2025, and you'll see there's 2025, 30 and beyond, that by 2025, there'll be enough renewable resource potential to meet 100% uh, of demand from the grid just by 2025. And so the obvious question to that was what? Well, are, are we ready for that? Uh, and so we set out on a, uh, on a journey uh, to become ready uh, because there is not a gigawatt scale grid in the world that can operate at 100% uh, renewable energy instantaneously. Each dot there shows a 30 minute um, dispatch period. So by instantaneous, I mean uh, 30 minutes. Uh, and those intervals are shown uh, throughout the year. And of course, if the data shows that we have enough renewable resource potential by 2025 to meet 100% of demand, then as I said, the obvious question is, well, what are the actions that we need to put in place uh, to be able to ready ourselves to manage a grid of such high penetration of renewable energy and to be able to, to transport, utilise and transport those free and zero carbon electrons uh, to Australian homes and businesses. So that exploration uh, began with what was called the engineering framework. It set out uh, a whole series of different operating conditions for which uh, we uh, would likely see in the future. Things like fewer synchronous generators online, um, uh, extensive grid scale, variable renewable energy, more storage in the system, uh, structural shifts in demand um, and changing patterns in, uh, in energy use. Um, but again, we kind of needed to get back to, so what's the engineering behind it? And, and how can we, um, uh, what do we need to do to be able to operate uh, the grid for periods of 100% renewable energy? So the roadmap gave us this, uh, gives us this answer. Um, it's pretty complex. Um, it's also a great read, um, maybe slightly the next level of, uh, of detail if you're interested, but it, it splits things into, uh, into three broad categories. Power system security. Um, so that's maintaining that secure um, technical envelope um, of operating the power system. Um, system operability and resource adequacy uh, and capability. And look, there are, I think there are 150 priority different actions in there. Um, each of those has a number of subcomponents. So you get up to five or 600 odd different um, you know, engineering actions that need to be taken to ensure that we can manage a stable power system. And some of those are for us. Um, as the system and market operator. Some of them are for the transmission and distribution networks. Some of them are for regulators. Some of them are for, um, are for uh, other market participants. 
And it really does lay out um, the fact that this journey to a high renewables grid um, is a journey for everyone, but hopefully um, this sets out to, um, to architect that roadmap. So um, I'll, I'll just spend a minute on a couple of the insights there. Uh, one of them um, is that, and I think probably a foundational one is that just because there are periods of time where renewable resources can meet 100% of demand, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to run, that the system is going to run at 100% uh, renewables. Uh, and I, maybe I'll just bring that to life with a, uh, with a slide, actually, which shows um, the two potential days. The day at the top left um, has... Uh, periods of time where demand could be met by 100% renewable energy, um, but the system doesn't dispatch it. Uh, and why is that? Because at the evening peak, uh, the white space that you see is the difference between uh, demand um, and renewable generation. And of course, uh, we need thermal generation to be able to uh, spin up quickly and to fill in the gap between uh, demand and supply. Uh, Coal-fired power stations, which are, of course, the bulk of our power system at the moment, cannot spin up uh, that quickly. And therefore, you, you see throughout the day uh, that you have this, uh, this black segment uh, where uh, coal-fired is, power is still providing power uh, into the grid. On the bottom though, um, you see a different scenario where actually a significant amount more renewable generation than, than demand. Um, and there we see that because there isn't a gap, uh, we can see that in this scenario, uh, renewables could meet 100% of demand. Um, in fact, um, there isn't a need for coal. What's shown here is a little bit of gas um, in the just to meet the evening peak. Um, and that's obviously as the sun goes down and perhaps the wind drops off a little bit, uh, we do need that firming capacity uh, to be able to balance uh, supply and demand. Um, and whether that's gas or hydro uh, is not necessarily a matter of uh, physics and engineering, but a matter of uh, market economics um, and uh, price signals. So some of those engineering roadmaps uh, uh, actions um, are more technical. So it requires us to uh, redesign um, the system restart process, for example, which has historically always uh, relied on big thermal plant to be, um, to be there to restart the system. We need to find new ways of doing that with uh, distributed and, and renewable generation. Uh, we have to have uh, a different coordinated approach to um, uh, managing outages and maintenance on transmission and distribution networks um, to allow for the different uh, profiles of, uh, of generation. Uh, we need to ensure that uh, the solar systems that we connect, those PV systems that are on, as I said, a third of uh, detached households at the moment, have the right inverters on them at the right Australian standards that can be resilient to um, uh, disturbances and not disconnect from the system, and that we're able to have control um, of, those, uh, of those PV systems in emergency situations. And as Michael said earlier, um, We've experienced uh, a number of disruptions throughout this year, um, and those disruptions do give us um, a line of sight and visibility into some of the challenges that um, exist in um, operating high renewables grids. Um, in June this year, we faced a significant market disruption, um, and I'm going to come back to that one shortly. Um, and in November, um, as Michael said, a, a storm um, downed a transmission tower uh, that left South Australia electrically, um, certainly from an AC perspective, um, disconnected from the rest of the national electricity market. Um, and um, you probably know that South Australia has a very high proportion of uh, renewable energy. As it's AC connected into the rest of the national electricity market, um, it, is, um, it uses that connection to balance supply and demand and obviously to provide some of those essential system services. But when it's disconnected, um, 
it is a very high renewables penetration grid uh, that's running on its own. So without that, um, I guess that umbilical cord uh, back to the rest of the national electricity market, um, some real challenges arise actually. Um, so I know that chart might look a bit manic, particularly for 10 past nine in the morning, um, but it is pretty interesting. So that is the generation profile for South Australia while it was electrically disconnected from the rest of the, the NEM. Uh, the uh, colours in there that you see are predominantly renewable, so the green, brown uh, and yellow, uh, and there is some gas firming. Um, and that is, um, as I said, the, the, the power mix um, for South Australia on its own. The fascinating part about this slide is uh, actually the renewables penetration, which is the, the dark line uh, that's associated with the right-hand side um, axis, which on a number of occasions is above 90%. And in fact, at one point there, it's 91.5% um, instantaneous renewables penetration on, that, on the Friday morning. That was in part um, uh, helped by uh, the installation of four synchronous condensers that have been uh, in the investment pipeline and the um, installation pipeline for, for some time that are strategically placed in the South Australian uh, network. And those um, synchronous condensers, 1950s technology, but, uh, but pretty helpful, um, provide those system services that give real stability, uh, system strength, inertia, voltage control, um, all of the characteristics that are, have been historically provided by uh, big coal-fired power stations and thermal, thermal plant. And look, as in, in any operational crisis, um, the role of collaboration across the industry and with governments uh, was enormous. Um, it, in, in our case, um, one of the major challenges was actually managing uh, the amount of rooftop solar that was um, that the system could cope with. Um, we were only able to achieve that with the um, upgrades to inverter control that have been um, uh, that have flowed through the industry uh, recently. Um, and I was saying to Michael and Pierre Luigi earlier this morning is a, um, uh, is a, is a great example of research flowing through to real-time operations um, in, a, in a very short period of time. One of the other challenges we had was obviously um, navigating and managing frequency. Um, so the frequency of the system was... Um, uh, was frankly quite challenging with uh, quite low uh, thermal generation available. Uh, and we used the, um, uh, the Hornsdale big batteries um, uh, frequency response capabilities to provide as much headroom as we could in either direction for frequency raise and frequency lower. Um, uh, we were able to use the Hornsdale wind farm as well for frequency control. Uh, and of course, um, the gas fire generation was, uh, was pretty critical in, in, in ensuring a stable system. So look, early days in really the detailed engineering investigation um, of this um, incident, uh, but some of those insights there um, uh, will be critical as, um, as we've said in navigating towards those high renewable penetration uh, grids. Um, I, look, I say pretty often that um, uh, the road to net zero and through Australia's energy transition, um, it's going to have bumps on it. Uh, we're going to have incidents like these. Uh, the important things are twofold. One is that we uh, navigate through it um, collaboratively, openly um, and constructively. And the second is that we look back and we learn as much as we can. We're never going to have perfect foresight about um, all the operating conditions that we um, could that we could face. But learning from these and then in putting those lessons back into uh, daily operations is uh, is critical. So um, AMO's intervention in the national electricity market in June um, was another example of. Um, of current operations uh, that were really challenging, um, that had um, some pretty profound uh, lessons for us. Um, of course, that uh, that incident was NEM wide, uh, 
Uh, but I'm just going to focus on New South Wales for a minute, um, just to make the, uh, the story a little more specific. Uh, at that point in time, we saw that um, uh, New South Wales had coal plants that had pretty limited um, coal supply. Uh, gas generation was constrained uh, by the ability to secure gas. Um, and hydro generation that was um, unable to release water because of um, downstream um, constraints. And in, in that environment, ensuring that there is sufficient generation to be able to meet demand um, is actually, it's pretty challenging. Uh, and so managing the generation profile um, to store energy during the day and then release it during those, uh, those peak periods um, was uh, ve was very challenging, um, but another good insight into uh, managing um, high renewables grids. So let me move on. Um, last week, we also released a number of uh, quite technical reports. So now I've gone ISP, definitely read that. Um, roadmap to 100% renewables, you should definitely read that, but getting more technical. Now we're into the quite technical reports, which I, I think are definitely worth a read um, on system strength on inertia and on frequency control, we call it um, uh, NSCAS. Um, many folks will know that inertia is obviously the ability of uh, the power system to maintain its frequency through disturbances um, and system strength is really that ability to um, maintain a stable uh, voltage waveform uh, through, well, through normal operation as well as through disturbances. Um, System strength, it turns out, is um, location specific, whereas inertia is, um, is broadly location um, agnostic. And <clears throat> our most recent report uh, looks at a number of different nodes um, across the national electricity market and what happens over time when you put in more and more renewable energy um, into the national electricity market. <clears throat> now, it turns out it's a bit like... Um, Securing a beach towel on the sand on a windy day with a number of different pebbles. And over time, as the wind blows more and more, you've got to put more pebbles and heavier pebbles. And that's essentially what this report is, uh, is trying to unpick. How big and how many? <clears throat> and the good news is that there are ways to maintain adequate system strength with the amount of renewables that we see uh, flooding into the system in the ISP's step change scenario. And in fact, um, to be specific about it, <clears throat> uh, to get to 100% renewable energy, um, the equivalent of 40 new synchronous con condensers are required to meet inertia and system strength requirements across the national electricity market. And 40 syncons, Sounds like a big investment, um, but it's unlikely that that'll be the actual solution anyway, to be honest. I mean, what we'll see is um, a proliferation of new technology like grid forming inverters, uh, like uh, existing power stations that are retrofitted with flywheels um, to act in syncon mode. Uh, so there'll be a, a number of different um, uh, solutions that actually unfold, but knowing that you can do it with 1950s technology, well, that's a pretty good start. The other place uh, we should go is, is connecting that new generation. Um, and the connection of such an enormous amount of new renewable generation, new firming capacity, um, and of course the system stability um, technologies is critical. Um, and AEMO has been on a big journey to uplift our, uh, our connections capability uh, together with, uh, with industry, actually. And today, we've got 147 different uh, projects representing about uh, 21 gigawatts uh, of, uh, of generation. There are at some point in the AMO connection process between kind of application for connection all the way through to um, the commissioning of the, uh, of the asset. <clears throat> As I said, we've been on quite a journey to improve that connections process and, um, and actually have made quite significant progress. This financial year, I expect that we will connect five gigawatts of, of generation into the national electricity market, 
Last financial year, it was four gigawatts. The year before that, it was three gigawatts. And so trajectory here is very good, but we need to be able to connect five gigawatts every year for the rest of the decade uh, to meet the uh, targets that are required. <clears throat> In July, we connected the first uh, grid scale, uh, grid forming battery actually, um, 150 megawatts um, that provides inertia support. So, you know, new technologies are coming onto the grid as well. And in a first for actually any power system in the world, <clears throat> we have launched uh, what we call the connection simulator tool. And that is uh, a tool that enables developers to directly access AMO's power system model uh, and test their, their models against our full system model and enables them to identify faults, um, tweak their models. And so um, when, they, uh, when they submit their connection application, uh, things go much more smoothly because they've ironed out um, all the bugs against our model uh, beforehand. Um, I said that's uh, world leading. It is truly world leading. There is nowhere else in the world where developers have access um, to a full system uh, EMT model of the grid. And I think it's outstanding. <clears throat> so the commercial side of the grid though, um, does need as much um, updating as the technical side. And um, the NEM 2025 program that I mentioned before um, is, um, uh, is a major part of that. The NEM 25 program seeks to implement the Energy Security Board's recommendations, which were um, endorsed by National Cabinet um, late last year. Uh, and these... Um, implementing four different pathways, one around resource adequacy, uh, one around essential system services, one around distributed energy resources, um, and uh, of course, uh, transmission access. Uh, complemented by a data strategy, and you'll see uh, a number of sort of ESB publications that, uh, that do pop up um, uh, that pursue this further. Um, as, um, as an example, um, AMO is in the process of launching um, two new markets for fast frequency response of uh, fast frequency raise and a fast frequency uh, lower that will keep the system uh, more secure uh, going forward. Um, so uh, uh, I, I talked about integrating DER as well, um, obviously such a, a critical part of our future system um, as we see more and more investment at customer premises um, and enabling that to be firstly secure uh, and then secondly as flexible as possible uh, is, uh, is really critical. So um, I, I've a part of those uh, Energy Security Board recommendations was also um, a capacity mechanism. Um, and uh, I was actually uh, in Brisbane yesterday uh, and uh, with energy ministers as they decided to, um, uh, to move forward with a capacity investment scheme, uh, which I'm delighted to see actually. Uh, I mentioned capacity as firming capacity as number two in that list of four. Uh, and I've said um, on many occasions actually that um, having the right level of dispatchable capacity is absolutely critical uh, for, uh, for the, uh, the, the stability of the power system and to unlock um, as much renewable energy as, uh, as is possible. So lastly then, um, uh, is our operations technology roadmap. And look, the reason for this is that um, AEMO really needs to modernize itself um, as a system and market operator. As a power system with um, higher levels of variable renewable energy, we need the tools and the capabilities to be able to manage such a grid. Um, we need to modernize our control rooms to have the right level of, uh, of visibility of the power system uh, and to provide our experienced and really capable operators uh, with the information that they need to make the right decisions to ensure a, uh, a stable system. Uh, having just traveled over to see some of our sister um, system and market operators recently, um, this is a topic that is on everyone's mind, but Australia's transition is so rapid and actually our, um, our operational tools are probably a little bit behind uh, where they need to be. 
So we have set out um, a vision for what our toolkit should look like um, in the operational space. Um, and that is from uh, planning and forecasting, uh, monitoring and reporting and analytics, uh, really to make sure that um, the operational control of the grid um, is um, not only in safe hands, but has the, has the right operational uh, tools available. Uh, bridging that gap between where we are today and what we need uh, to operate the system in the future. So I'm going to take a breath because I've talked a lot about engineering, um, but there's obviously much more to the power system transformation than just engineering. And frankly, um, if you're as interested in these topics as I am, we could spend like hours on each one of those um, little topics that I, that I covered there. But the power system exists to serve the interests of Australian consumers. I said before that AMO's role is to ensure safe, reliable and affordable energy today and to enable the energy transition for the benefit of Australians. And that position of acting, always acting in the interests of consumers is enshrined in the National Electricity Objective, which governs um, AEMO and, um, and governs everything, frankly, that, uh, that we do at AEMO. We are working closely with uh, regulators, with industry, um, to ensure that the cost of energy um, is as low as it possibly can be. And look, um, energy costs will be in the headlines today for sure, um, and has been uh, throughout the year. Um, and it is frankly pretty heartbreaking to see the impact of energy prices on all people, but particularly our most vulnerable who you hear stories about whether they choose between heating and eating. I'll come back to, it's actually people that the energy system serves. Um, and so through this transition, you know, people matter most actually, um, and we're here to, to, to serve um, our consumers. So um, I think that underpins everything that we do at AMO to make sure that um, we are always acting in the best interests of consumers. And look, I talked about price, but it's also about um, uh, you know, building the transmission that is required it does require social license and um, building linear infrastructure does impact communities. Um, there are communities there who don't benefit from a big line that connects new low cost sources for renewable generation to towns and cities that do need it. And we need to work really closely um, and early on with those communities to build the social license for that infrastructure that does, uh, that, that does need to get built. And like I said, in my view, the best way to do that is early, um, is openly um, and constructively with the communities that, that, that are affected. Um, at AMO, what we've just started actually is um, a, uh, a, an advisory council on social license. Um, we've brought together some uh, terrific people uh, who have been doing this for a long time uh, to help advise us uh, on uh, the needs of communities, the needs of our First Nations people, um, and the needs of our uh, rural communities who are affected by the energy transition that often when we flick a switch, um, you know, we don't think about, uh, about that impact. So that's been a lot to take in. Uh, it's been quite a lot to say actually too. So uh, Michael, I'd be delighted to take any questions, but uh, thank you. Well, thank you, Daniel. And uh, we've got time for q and I'll lead off with one question, but then we'll take questions from the floor. Um, what really struck me with that use of synchronous condensers all over the country was, you know, you talk about 1950s technology and the other things that can just take over and surprise us all. Coupled with just the massive rate of deployment of new stuff that we need to get to net zero, are we able to move to a, a, a world where a developer or a group of developers can put together a bunch of stuff and know our priority before coming to AMO 
that whatever they're proposing to build collectively won't make the rest of the system worse. Mm. And so you might say you need to have certain technical characteristics. You also need approvals from local communities and environmental impact statements, all of those things. You could almost imagine a, a mm. checklist of things. So, yep, biodiversity, indigenous estate, um, um, local communities, and the NEM, mm. tick, 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 approved. Mm. Is that, is that a possibility, that kind of thinking? Yeah, look, I think it is. It's a great question. And um, uh, having been a developer before coming to AMO, um, it's it, it's something that's absolutely on your mind as to um, how do I get this project up and running as quickly as possible? And that's great for developers. It's also great for us as consumers. It's great for us as AMO to, for developers to really know um, what they're shooting for. Um, the NEM, uh, which I'll focus on here, separate in, in WA, of course, there's a federated system. So we have to work um, uh, in the different state jurisdictions. And so having a singular answer to that is, um, is often impossible. But uh, we are working towards a, a place where developers really do know what's required. Probably the best example of that at the moment is in New South Wales, where they're um, the New South Wales roadmap, which outlines a renewable energy zone or set of zones, gives developers, here's what you need to build in that zone. And then we'll take, as in the New South Wales Energy Company, we'll take care of the network bit. Uh, so long as you play to these guidelines and here's your tick the, like, here's what you have to do for yep. local communities, First Nations uh, supply chain. So yeah, we're getting there. We're not quite there yet. And each state will be slightly different, but there are definitely examples of uh, heading towards that uh, right. as a as real clarity for developers, because as I said before, the easier we can make it for developers, the more renewable energy, the right. more firming capacity we can get, the faster and the easier the transition is for everyone. Terrific, terrific. All right, uh, we've got, Quite a few questions from the audience. Uh, hands up, anyone? We've got several questions there. Professor Peel. Jackie's a colleague of mine. <laughs> thank you very much, Michael, and thank you, Daniel, for your presentation. Um, I'm Jackie Peel. I'm the Director of Melbourne Climate Futures and, and uh, Neighbours with MEI in, in Melbourne Connect. Um, I was I really appreciated your your emphasis at the end that the energy system is ultimately for people rather than just a grand technological experiment. But I did want to ask you, um, there's obviously been a lot of technical innovation and and agility in, in meeting the demands. I was wondering if you had reflections on how we reproduce that kind of agility in the policy system, any things that you've seen in your own experience with AEMO or your sister operators about how we also can make the policy system uh, fit for purpose to to uh, manage that quick transition. And do you mean a regulatory policy system or within AMO? Yeah, no, I mean your interaction yeah. then with, uh, you know, state and federal governments yeah. and the regulatory system. Yeah, thank you. I mean, that's a, uh, a really good question that we could spend quite a lot of time on. And one of the um, uh, challenges in Australia is obviously this federated system. And um, Michael mentioned that before coming to AMO 18 months ago, um, I spent quite a lot of time in the UK um, and in the US, but the UK is like one government. Um, it is, okay, there's Scotland and Wales and all right uh, but it's pretty it's, it, it's a much more simple policy environment uh, whereas here uh, again I was in Brisbane yesterday with energy ministers um, and you know what's great about the political environment at the moment is that there's a huge amount of alignment and energy behind the energy transition that hasn't been the case always um, and does make that uh, that policy environment uh, quite challenging if I'm honest with you, I don't really know what the what the best answer is on um, how AMO and other um, market bodies, and in fact industry as well, uh, interact best with policymakers. I would say um, my fundamental principle would be um, alignment on objectives 
which I do think we have, which is good. Um, openness and transparency and collaboration, which again, I do think we have at the moment. Um, and then constructively working through these challenges and learning. Um, look, I, I'm, um, people accuse me of being a glass half full type of person and I am, I'm an optimist by nature. Uh, I do think we're in a pretty good position in terms of policy at the moment. And I'm pretty optimistic about uh, the couple of years ahead. So, so when the system black happened in 2016, okay. there were other issues uh, that related to policy and governance and personalities as well mm. that that have been, there's been an awful lot of, of, of innovation in the last five, six years, to yep. further your point, whether it's glass the, half full or not, has been- The I environment has changed enormously. Enormously. Since then. Yep. enormously. Um, yes, up, the gentleman standing up. Uh, yeah, Daniel, uh, I have a question concerning what it might call energy justice. So you refer to people at the bottom end that have to make a choice between heating and eating. That might be in hot weather, cooling and heating, eating. But at the other end of the spectrum of the uh, class system, we have people at the top who are using much more than their share of the energy. Uh, people who have multiple homes, who have McMansions as homes, have multiple vehicles, even if they're electrical vehicles. Uh, and so do we need to also think about system change? For example, climate justice activists argue not, not climate change, system change. So, so I know you're an engineer, and I, and I used to be an engineer. Uh, I became an anthropologist. Uh, and so as an anthropologist, I think about social systems. Any, any thoughts as a, an engineer along those lines? Well, the first question, Michael, is can you ever be an ex-engineer? I don't, I don't think you can. You, you, you can't take that hat off. Might be a reformed yeah. engineer. <laughs> you might not be an ex-engineer. Um, I think that's a really hard question. Again, um, I'm going to steer away from the policy side of um, uh, you know, whether it's right that um, uh, small proportions of the population have access to um, and use high amounts of energy. Um, I think the same could be said for, for wealth. Um, I think that's that's challenging. I think what, what we focus on is um, is trying to ensure that there is um, equity, equality, affordability, um, system security for uh, for all Australians, regardless of uh, of how much uh, they are uh, they're demanding of the energy system. And one of the things that we've seen um, through the proliferation of uh, of rooftop solar and um, and distributed energy resources, so uh, including electric vehicles, um, home batteries, etc., is that. Um, it, it is a disproportionate effect. Um, and you know, in some instances, you, you'll know that um, uh, and it's high energy consumers with a high demand profile actually aren't paying very much. Um, and because they are generating uh, off their own rooftop, not using the uh, networks. Um, and I think that causes question about the pricing methodology for um uh, for, you know, for, for networks and the energy system in general. I think they are very good questions that we do have to tackle. Um, and I don't think we've got the answers on them yet. One more question from the floor. We might take it from the gentleman here, and then we'll need to, to move on for the rest um, of the day. I guess it's a three-parter. Um, it's been short, though. Um, right. Daniel, yeah, firstly, can. I'd like to say <laughs> thank you very much. I have to say that AMO is doing a great job in a very difficult circumstances at the moment with the transition um, and it's very uh, very impressive the work that you actually do. Um, second one is a correction which is uh, on the synchronous condensers um, we actually installed our first one in 1920. In hey, the there you so, go. So over 100 years old now um, I would also say that solar PV has been going since the 1800s so what is old is new so it's a good and thirdly um, given the uh, government incentives and policies that are changing on a day-by-day -day basis through state and, and federal politics. Um, do you feel the market itself is actually still working? I'm, I'm looking at the islanding information that you put in for South Australia. And mm. yes, 
uh, you had periods of 90% um, renewable penetration, but then at night you had 90% gas-fired generation. Now, if Torrens wasn't around, no one would be building new gas-fired power stations given the disincentives in the market and also government policies. So is there something else that has to change? Yeah, so let me give you a direct answer to that one, which is the, the market that we have at the moment is not fit for the energy transition. Um, and I've said that publicly before. Uh, we um, th There are some fundamental evolutions that we do need to see. <clears throat> and it's essentially um, a principle of <clears throat> uh, disaggregating all of the services that came with that energy only market, which was fine for the period um, up until now slash a few years ago um, into new markets. So we do need a market for dispatchable capacity. And that's why I'm pleased that the capacity investment scheme was the first step um, yesterday. Uh, we do need markets for uh, faster frequency response and they're coming. We do need ultimately markets for inertia, uh, for system strength and for the other services that will um, that disappear as byproducts of energy produced from um, big synchronous generation units. So uh, I, I do think that the market needs quite significant um, evolution. Um, I think that's not a unanimous view, uh, but certainly strongly held by, by several, many. But, um, I, I think there's probably not a consensus on exactly what the future markets need to uh, need to look like. Um, but first step is capacity. And then, um, as I said, continue to um, unbundle those markets that um, uh, so that we can access the services that did used to come as a byproduct. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll ask the last question because it, it's a very much directed towards the younger people in, in the mm. room here. So we've got this energy transition. We've got a 2030 target. Mm. It's a law now. Um, will we? How many younger people will the sector need, and what kinds of things might they do? Because there's a lot of people in the mm, room here mm. who are asking themselves these kinds mm. of questions right now. Mm. Uh, do you know what? Um, can I start with a little bit of a story? Of course. Yeah. Uh, so about two years ago, um, I, I was in the UK with uh, my wife and my kids. The kids are at the top end of high school. Um, and I remember distinctly, I convinced my wife to go to the UK for three years. Uh, we stayed there seven. Um, and we had this uh, walk along the whatever, and we agreed we're going to stay in, um, in the UK until the kids finish high school. And then I got a phone call about this job. Um, and I said to Lucy, oh, like, there's no way that I can not do that. Um, and I feel like um, at, I feel like personally, um, I personally have the best job in the world, um, that there is no better place to be to make an impact on the world um, uh, as in Australia's energy transition. Um, and I just, anyone who's thinking about being part of it in whatever sh way, shape or form um, is fits your interests in through economics, through engineering, uh, through policy, uh, I feel like it's not only um, technically really interesting, um, good for an engineer or you know, it's good for someone technically minded, um, it's doing, um, doing good for the world. Um, and being part of the biggest transformation that, uh, frankly, Australia um, has seen in, in decades, in a generation, and leading the world um, in an energy transition that is, frankly, inspirational. Uh, and it's, uh, I find it really energising to be mm. right at the forefront of this global transition. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how many people, but uh, let's make it individual. If you're thinking about being part of the energy transition, please do. It is a great place to be. I don't know anybody who struggles for motivation. Mm. Actually, people love it. So that's a way to end, end the seminar. Um, thank you, Daniel. Great to see you again. Thanks.